Uh, welcome um, to uh, Technology, Globalization, and Culture. We've got uh, a few folks uh, more than usual. Happy to have you, as always. Um, welcome to our, our class. Um, about eight months ago, I'd say, maybe a little more, um, my wife and I were having dinner with friends in a uh, uh, place pretty far away from here, Elgin and Gail Johnson, who are right here, smiling. Um, and um, they're both mathematicians of some repute, and, uh, and you may know them from around Iowa State University. They, um, Gail, I think it was, said, you know, I just read this book called $20 per gallon, and uh, I think it would be great for your globalization course. And um, so, knowing Gail as well as I do and respecting her, I bought the book and read it, and, and so it was. And that's how we, we came to be together tonight with uh, Chris Steiner. Chris is, um, he got an engineering degree from the University of Illinois, journalism degree from Northwestern. Um, $20 per gallon tells, uh, I'm not going to, he's going to tell what's in it, but it tells how, um, as the price of gas goes up, it's his speculation on how our world's going to change. Uh, I'm so delighted to have him here. I'm delighted to have a job where I get to say, hey, that would be interesting. Let's do that. It's like you get white hair and get to be a full professor. Sometimes you get to do that. And I'm delighted that Chris is here. Please help me welcome Chris Steiner. Okay, okay, now we're going. Very nice. There's the technology part of the course right there. Uh, but it's also a globalization and a culture course. So I'm interested to know, is there anybody in the course who reads Korean? Anybody? Speaks Korean? Any Korean speakers? No? No? Huh. Well, I, I just got this. I just got five Korean versions of my book in, and I brought one. I figured maybe there'd be one person. Uh, obviously, I guess we all know what it says, but it still doesn't make any sense to me. I will say that if you see the cover, it's totally different design. And I only bring this up to you because basically I just got this this morning, so I figured I had to tell somebody. This is way cooler than, than the US version of the book, I think. I, I don't know. I don't know what you guys think of the cover. Do you all have the book? No? Well, if you've seen it, this cover is way cooler, and I had never seen it before today, so they redesigned everything. If anyone decides that they do speak Korean, I have this for you. <laughs> so <clears throat> let me know after the talk. I'm also interested uh, to hear what the breakdown is between grad students and undergrads. Well, how many undergrads are here in the course? OK, so it's mostly undergrads. Uh, Jim told me that. You know, it was a mix of seniors and grad students, and I was just thinking back to my time as an undergrad engineer uh, versus my time as a graduate student. I remember I was in a very different place in life uh, at those two stages. I, and I remember having classes with graduate students as an undergrad and being on like teams where we had to tackle projects together, and uh, it didn't always go that well, um, just because undergrads tend to do what undergrads do. Uh, but anyway, th that's really great. Uh, and then my last, my last point, so there's two mathematicians here. Are you able to explain stochastic calculus to me after, after this is over? Because I'm, I'm trying to write an article on something, and I'm trying to figure that whole thing out. It has to do with high-speed trading. And <laughs> do, you, do you know anything about that? Uh, <clears throat> my, my sister is a mathematician, and she could not help me. So. Uh, Anyway, well, I'd like to thank Professor Bernard for asking me here. It's, it's really flattering uh, to be able to engage with people at high-level universities. These are the places that, of course, this being an engineering school, where the technological advances we need in the future are going to take place. But not only that, they're the places where kernels of thought first take root. These kernels that go on to affect our national consciousness. And Iowa is an especially interesting state when it comes to energy. As I'm sure most of you know, 
this state produces more than its fair share of contributions towards a new energy future, whether it's biofuels or new formulas for plastic and fertilizer, there's a lot going on in Iowa. I actually spent time in Iowa writing my book. There's several different settings in the book in Iowa, one in Northwest Iowa, one in Eastern Iowa. Um, and staying on that topic, so here we are in Iowa. I'm interested to hear how many of you have read The Omnivore's Dilemma? So, so quite a few. And, and of course, the, the uh, former, the first half of that book is all about Iowa, uh, or about corn anyway. And, um, and certainly there's more to Iowa than corn, but it's, that is the best part of the book. Uh, it, for those of you who have read it, it's a really good book. But to me, the powerful part of that book is the front half where he talks about the corn paradigm of our food pyramid. And uh, my favorite part of that first half of the book is when Michael Pollan, who's the author, takes his family to a McDonald's drive through And they all get him, his son, and his wife get typical things. His son gets an order of chicken McNuggets. He gets a quarter pounder with cheese. And his wife gets a salad. And... For those of you who read the book, you already know what I'm going to say, but he later takes the same exact meal to a physicist at the University of California, Berkeley, and the physicist puts each of these items in what's called a mass spectrometer, and that allows them to see exactly where organically each of these molecules in the food, in the food originated from. And as it turns out, most of the meal is corn, albeit none of it was corn when they ate it. So the quarter pounder that Michael Pollan ate was 58% corn. The salad dressing that his wife ate was 65% corn. And the milkshake that his son drank was 80% corn. And if you take that example out of the food world and move it into the physical world, everything we're standing on, sitting on, talking amidst isn't corn, it's oil. And this is a great room to talk about because if you look at the carpet, the chairs, the cushions, a lot of the additives in the concrete, everything you're looking at is made, at least on some level, from oil. And if it wasn't made from oil, it probably got here because of oil. And I think when we think of gas prices and oil prices, we instinctively think of pulling up to a gas pump, and putting our hand on the pump and pulling out our wallet and pulling out our credit card and paying 50 or 60 or depending on how big your car is, even more for a tank of gas. But when we think of gas only in that way and oil only in that way, we forget about the half that is all this stuff. And it's both of those halves that are going to completely indelibly affect our lives as we move into the future. So, and as I said, I remember college. So even if you drift off during my talk, remember this. In the future, there will be less oil supply and more oil demand. The price of gasoline and oil, for these reasons, among others, will go up. The reality of higher energy prices will be unequivocally the most powerful force of the 21st century. So during my short time up here, I'd like to break down three things. First, why oil prices will go up. And that's the easy part. Secondly, and this to me is the biggie, what kind of changes we can expect to come as the price goes up. And of course, we'll just touch on a couple highlights. But this to me is the most important part of the peak oil conversation. And it's something that hasn't really gotten the coverage it deserves until recently. And there's a lot of things been pushing that into the news in the last few years, which we'll talk about. And okay, so we know, the third thing is we know change is coming. Well, what does that mean? What can we do to prepare? Should we prepare? How do we prepare? And so first, let's talk about why oil prices will go up. Some of you may have heard of the International Energy Agency. It's based in Paris. It was created during the 1973-1974 oil embargo by countries like the United States, 28 countries, who were concerned about the world's future oil supply and how it was being concentrated 
in fewer and fewer hands, and how those hands typically were controlled by people who weren't necessarily friendly toward the West. And so the IEA has been tasked with the duty of watching how much oil we have and how much we can expect to have in the future and how much of that is going to make it to the Western world. And by and large, the IEA has been bullish on the future of oil and it, our ability to meet future demand. Now, a couple of years ago, five or six years ago, the IEA changed its tune slightly. It said, well, let's, let's watch supply a little closer. There's maybe more of a story here. And then last summer, the IEA issued a statement, the, they issued a report, their head economist issued a report that said they expect, now lucky for me, that's when my book came out, that peak oil will occur in the next 10 years. And they went on to say that knowing the decline rate in our current fields is much more aggressive than they ever thought, the IEA says that even if demand remains steady, that's world oil demand, and it won't, and we'll get to that in a second, the world will have to find three Saudi Arabias by 2030 just to maintain current production and keep up with current demand. If we want to keep up with projected demand increases, we'd have to find six Saudi Arabias worth of oil by 2030. And let me briefly address a newsy item here, somewhat newsy now. Everybody, of course, is aware of the environmental disaster that unfolded in the Gulf of Mexico earlier this year. But until that started happening, the Gulf really had been hailed by a lot of Western energy types as the place that we can count on to be our saving well as Americans, the place we can count on new oil finds to keep us in domestic supply in the future. And in fact, last year, BP, or as President Obama calls them, British Petroleum, announced a giant find in the Gulf of Mexico, and giant is not my word, it's their word. And BP found in a deep water well three billion barrels of oil. Now that's a big deal, it's a lot of oil. It sounds like a lot, and it is. But in fact, and we all know about deep oil wells now, deep water wells, because of the news down in the Gulf of Mexico, about a third of that is recoverable. So it's really about a billion barrels worth of oil to the world market. And so what does that mean? Well, again, it's a big deal. That oil right now is worth $75 billion. That's a nice bump to BP's balance sheet. But on the global supply level, that amount of oil is nothing. The world uses 83 million barrels of oil every day. The United States uses 20 million barrels of oil every day. It would last the U.S. about two months. It would last the world less than two weeks. So in short, this find, which was the biggest in friendly waters and any type of friendly territory in decades, was a big deal for BP. It was a big deal for their shareholders. But to you and to me and the rest of the world, it means nothing. So that's the supply side. Let's talk briefly about the demand side. I think we've all heard the cliches about the burgeoning middle classes in places like China and India. And largely, those cliches are true. To put in simple terms, right now there's a billion people on the earth living American-style lives, and that includes all of us. By 2040, there's going to be three times as many. There's going to be three billion people living American-style lives. So that's an extra two billion people demanding the kind of energy, the kind of stuff, and the kind of lives we already have. That's an extra two billion people standing next to us at the world's oil spigot. So consider this. In the United States, we have 750 cars for every 1,000 people. 750 cars for every 1,000 people. What do you think that number is in China per 1,000 people? Anybody have a guess? Nothing. Yeah. Ten's a good guess. Yeah. Uh, so if we have 750, do they have 10? They don't even have 10. They have four. So it's 750 to four. So let's imagine over the course of the next several decades, China gets to even half our ratio. That's the equivalent of adding 500 million new vehicles to the roads of the planet. That's like adding two more United States worth of cars to the world. 
And it's important to realize that this is reality. This is going to happen. Last year, for the first time in the history of the automobile, the United States was not the largest car market in the world. It was China. They sold 13 million cars last year in China. And of course, they will remain the world's largest car market a long time in the future. In fact, by 2020, China's car market is going to be 40 million cars per year. That's only 10 years away, and that is double the size of the peak American car market, which happened several years ago. And they're not going to plateau at 40 million. They're going to keep going up. And that's in tandem with passing the United States as the largest energy user of all energy earlier this year. And they'll probably double us up in the next couple of decades. Now, the United States is still the largest user of oil in the world. But at least we're able to produce 8 million of the 20 million barrels per day we use. China has no such luxury. Their future demand will be met by wholly by imports. Rising global energy demand will have few roots here in North America. Do not make the mistake of judging energy markets by what you see here at home. The United States is no longer a big driver in new energy demand. Summing up, we have an energy supply when it comes to oil that's going to remain flat and will probably actually go down. And we have a demand that's clearly going to go up. So if you remember your supply and demand curves from Economics 101, supply goes down, demand goes up, the price has to go up. It's inevitable. So that's the why in terms of higher gas prices, and that's, to me, the easiest part to talk about. So what does that mean? Does that, does that mean future anarchy? Should we hoard canned food and guns? Has anybody built a bunker yet? Has anyone read uh, The Long Emergency? A couple people. That, that book will scare you. Uh, I don't think, I mean, that's more of an apocalyptic take on things. Um, kind of shoots from the hip, but it's, it's one take. I, I, my personal view is, is something far different, in fact. So let's just think about the price of gas in 2002. Across most of the country, it was about $1.25. And by 2007, it was $3. So the price of gas had almost tripled in that period. But the economy, of course, during that whole time, continued to grow at a very good pace. The economy didn't crash until gas prices were 450 across most of the country. And that wasn't the reason the economy crashed, we all know. Most of the reason the economy crashed was because of excessive consumer debt, overinflated home prices, and Wall Street, which was grossly overleveraged. But beyond macroeconomic concerns, what can we expect in the future? I've always been fascinated by the relationship between gas prices and human behavior. And, you know, it seems like this happens every 10 years or so. Uh, efficient markets, that whole theory comes back, the Chicago School, they call it, comes back into popular, wide-held belief on Wall Street. And then we have something like 2008 or 1998. And then we all realize that, oh, humans aren't really rational, are they? Uh, so what happened when we got to $2 gas? I remember thinking, and I was a civil engineer working in California at the time, and I remember thinking, this is going to change things. People are going to behave differently. They're going to buy different cars. They're going to live different places. They're going to demand different kinds of homes. I thought it was this watershed moment. Nothing happened at all. And then we got to $3 a couple of years later. And again, nothing happened. In fact, I paid for that professionally. We, we pitched projects to people that had added dense neighborhoods inside these subdivisions. Nobody wanted it. So we built the curvy roads, the stuff you see today that nobody wants, even though we were pitching something totally different at first. So what happened in 2008? Well, we got the $4. And if you recall, everything changed. It was pandemonium. It was the biggest story on the news almost every night. Gas prices, gas prices. You couldn't buy a Prius for anything close to sticker price, and you couldn't sell your SUV for 20 cents on the dollar. 
people were being straight up irrational. But I think that shows us that the changes that come from rising gas prices are as much a study in sociology as they are in economics. When I was putting my book together, I was looking for, as you might imagine, the most ridiculous paradigms I could find that relied on cheap oil. And one of them is Walmart. And this is a company, of course, that has affected our main streets more than any other. And I'd be remiss to say that the first granules of bad press that ever came out on Walmart, or the most major ones, in 1989, 1990, started here at Iowa State, when one of your professors named Kenneth Stone produced a research report that detailed the effect that Walmart had on Iowa small towns. And ever since then, you know, Walmart has been seen as kind of this destructive force that comes in to small towns. Now, people still want them, so there's the whole argument there. But my point is that Iowa State plays a big role in the discussion here. And in fact, I used some of Professor Stone's research in writing my book. So Walmart is a company with 6,000 suppliers. 80% of those are in China. And so how does it get these goods from China to the United States? Well, of course, it packs them on container ships in Chinese ports, ships them to the West Coast, and they get disseminated from there to Walmart's 4,000 stores. It's an incredible model, but it's one that's built wholly on cheap oil. When I looked at Walmart for my book, I profiled a few things. I wanted to find a product in their store that best exemplified the power of cheap oil. And my favorite, there were a lot of choices, by the way, but the, my, the favorite thing of mine was a desk that sold, there was a wooden desk, pretty small computer desk, sold for about 59 bucks. It was in Walmart about two years ago. And it was a pine desk, and it was made out of Russian wood. So what happened was migrant laborers would fell trees in Siberian forests, put the logs onto trains in Siberia, and then they'd ship these things south over the border into China, where then the wood would be milled and then set to another factory where workers earning close to nothing would assemble this wood into desks, then be put into boxes, then into containers, then shipped to China's east coast, where it'd go into container ships, then get shipped all the way across the Pacific Ocean, where it'd go to Long Beach, and San Diego, and Seattle. And then from there, those containers would be loaded onto Walmart trucks, of which there are 7,000 in North America. And then that would get disseminated to 250 different distribution centers in North America, which would then send those packages out to 4,000 different stores. And then you walk onto Walmart and buy a desk for 59 bucks. It's a powerful model, but again, one built wholly on cheap oil. So what happens when gas doubles in price, well, the Walmart model becomes a lot less effective. All big, all big box models, in fact, will be challenged by energy scarcity. Just as people moved into subdivisions that straddled the no man's land between Walmart and Main Street, just as Professor Stone wrote about, people will eventually go back in the direction from which they came. And we'll get to more of that in a second. Another one of my favorite paradigms to talk about is that of our airlines. And when I refer to the legacy airlines, I'm talking about United and American, Delta and Northwest. They built out their networks across this country and the world with a business assumption that jet fuel would make up 10 to 15 percent of their operational costs. Well, what happened in 2008 when gas was $4 a gallon? Well, jet fuel was 40% of their operational cost that year. And in fact, a lot of them were on the brink of extinction. The oil price coming back down saved their hides. So what happens when we get to 7 or $8 per gallon? Well, all of a sudden, jet fuel is now 60 70% of their operational costs. That is not sustainable. High jet fuel prices will kill off most of the airlines we know today. We'll be left with one or two national airlines. You'll still be able to fly, but it'll be something that only people who have to really do it are going to do it. 
We will no longer board a flight to the other side of the country like we're getting in a cab to go to the other side of town. As the airlines fade, of course, high-speed railway will rise in its place. And these high-speed railway centers will be placed where they've always been placed, at stations at the center of town. And, of course, most importantly, there's our driving paradigm. How does that roll into this? Well, driving has been the force behind all of our geographic expansion over the last century. It's not going to go away, but it'll cease to be the reason we build sprawling subdivisions, big box stores, and corporate office parks 10 miles from the closest restaurant. Driving, which has been so cheap for so many people for so long, will cease to be the reason people choose to live an hour from work. Driving will remain a powerful lever in our economy, make no doubt about that. But its cost will, in fact, reverse some of the changes it first helped bring about. So I can imagine you're saying, well, what about hybrid cars and battery-powered cars? You know, did you ever think about those? Well, of course. And those are going to play a bigger and bigger role on our roads in the future. But the idea that we're all just going to plug in and maintain our current lifestyles is not reality. There's two things standing in our way. One is the sheer size of the American car market. There's 250 million, 250 million vehicles on the roads of America right now. Even if we made 5 million electric cars a year, and let me tell you, that is an absolutely spectacularly giant figure that we're not even close to thinking about. But let's say it would still take 50 years to replace our fleet with electric vehicles. And then there's the added problem, the more obvious problem of electric cars costs. Now, everybody here will probably make a decent living. You're, going, you're getting out of a great school. You're going to go on maybe to grad school and have great jobs, and maybe you'll drive electric cars. But a lot of the country doesn't have a future like that. They're used to buying used cars. They're used to spending $10,000, $8,000, or $15,000. You're not going to be able to buy electric cars for $12,000. There will not be a large used electric car market out there. And why is that? Well, of course, because batteries go bad. And a battery right now is more than half the cost of an electric car. The Chevy Volt, for instance, is going to retail for more than $40,000. The battery is $25,000 of that cost. So what are people going to do? Well, they're going to take the path of least resistance. And that means changing how they live. And changing how people live usually means changing where they live. People are going to move to walkable neighborhoods. They're going to go places where their kids can walk easily to school, where they can catch a train or a bus to work, where they can walk to buy a gallon of milk. Right now, more than 4 million people in America drive more than 90 minutes in each direction to and from work. That is a statistic born wholly on cheap oil. This is a movement that's going to change our cities and towns indelibly. Consider the average American house has gone from 1,600 square feet in 1976 to 2,500 square feet nearly now. 60% of the increase came during the 1990s. And what were the 1990s marked by? Consistent, historically cheap gasoline. It's amazing the kind of sacrifices people would make in their lives, in the time they gave up with their families, and anything else they might do to get more square feet at home. And that's what drove out the excerpts. The Metropolitan Institute at Virginia Tech University estimates that by 2025, there will be an excess of 23 million large lot homes in America. That doesn't mean there'll be nobody in them, but it does mean that nobody will want them. There will be an erasure of equity, but it's nothing we haven't seen before. Cities like Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, St. Louis have lost half of their population in the last 50 years to suburbs, exurbs, and sprawl. Those people, a lot of them, will turn back to the infrastructure we built 100 years ago in our cities. Small, medium, and large-sized towns with those infrastructures will prosper again. And that being said, a lot of that depends on a big wild card here, and that is government and our leadership. Our leaders during the next 20 years are going to be faced with countless decisions on infrastructure. And infrastructure, of course, begets density. But what comes first, the density 
or the infrastructure, and that's a question cities are struggling with all the time. Look at Los Angeles. Well, they got the density, they don't have the infrastructure. So now they're trying to bore a subway right under an existing city. It's great, but it's very expensive. So here's an odd fact. What city in the 1990s do you suppose added more people than any other? Anybody have any guesses? And book readers aren't allowed to answer. Las Vegas. That's a very good guess. That's a very good guess. Another great guess. Oh, you guys are good. Um, Phoenix, Dallas, Las Vegas. No. Not Atlanta, not Denver. None of those boom towns that you very astutely guessed, because that's what I would have guessed. It was New York City. New York added almost a million people in the 1990s. But nobody noticed. Nobody noticed because New York is built to handle it. New York, the only reason New York can exist, the only reason it can function with 70,000 people per square mile on the island of Manhattan is because of the infrastructure that underpins the entire city. In the future, all of our cities are going to behave more like New York. Does that mean they're going to have 70,000 people per square mile? No. Does it mean they're going to have a 1, 2, 3, a 4, 5, 6, an NRW, QL, and 12 other subway lines coursing beneath their streets? It doesn't. But it does mean we're going to have to get smarter about density, about energy, and about the way we build our cities. In many ways, how America fares tomorrow in a world of scarcer energy resources comes down to the kind of leadership we have today. This group here, you're part of that leadership. Your role in shaping the young minds of our country and shaping the innovations of the future is inherently important when it comes to changing the direction of America. We need education more than ever to enable the America of the future, and that's a future, again, where energy is going to be more important than ever. To pivot, adjust, and continue being the most influential, powerful, and innovative country on the face of the planet. The decisions this group makes are going to affect all of us, but they'll affect the Midwest, of course, more than anywhere else. And staying on a similar theme, last month I had a chance to sit down and talk to Tim Brown. Tim Brown is the CEO of IDEO. And if you've heard of them, you know that they're a design company in San Francisco. And they're largely thought to be one of the more innovative companies in the world. They're responsible for a lot of things, among them the original Apple computer mouse. I wanted to talk to Tim about a problem that has vexed the Chicago tech crowd and the tech crowd of the Midwest for a long time. <clears throat> the biggest thing working against us in Chicago and in the Midwest when it comes to tech, crowd, the, uh, tech companies is that when a company from Ames or Madison or Champaign comes up with an innovation or an idea that draws a big chunk of venture capital, what's the first thing these guys do? They leave. They leave. They go to Palo Alto, or they go to Mountain View, or they go to San Jose, or San Francisco. Well, I said to Tim, well, wh why is this in this age of the internet, when anybody can live anywhere and work for anybody, why do these companies feel obliged to move to Silicon Valley? He said there's giant advantages to being physically in California's tech bed. It's the networking. It's the human capital of having so many engineers in one spot. There's an unstoppable amount of momentum there. And if I had a company, a startup, you'd have to think about going there. Let's say there's two tech companies, one in Florida, one in San Jose. The same kind of founders, the same idea. Which one's going to win out? It's going to be the one in San Jose every single time. Their product will evolve with the advantages of a community that talks, eats, and breathes innovation. When it comes to B round funding or C round funding, which companies can get money faster? The one in San Jose. So that's why these companies leave. They leave because they have to leave. They leave to give themselves the best possible chance at success. So now Silicon Valley is trying to do the same thing with energy. Their venture capital crowd 
the guys who make all this possible, they've been funding all sorts of ideas, companies, and people with new concepts on how to produce, refine, and distribute energy. But the good news for us outside of the valley is that they've hardly cornered the market on energy just yet. Silicon Valley, because of its software roots, they're, they're swinging for grand slams. They're trying to make 100 to 1 returns. They're trying to find things that, just like software, scale up very rapidly. But energy doesn't work like that. But they're getting smarter. The Midwest, with Iowa being one of our leaders, could be the next Silicon Valley of energy. This can happen any place where focus, innovation, and money come together. And Iowa is doing a better job than most states, I will tell you. I'm not sure if any of you read a cover story earlier this year in The Atlantic. It was called, Why America, or How America Can Rise Again. It was written by James Fallows, who spent the last three years in Beijing. And he comes to a number of conclusions, one of which I found very interesting. Fallow said that America still has, by far, the greatest university system in the world. Second place is not even close. He heard that everywhere he went. He heard it from Chinese academics, he heard it from Japanese academics, European academics. Everybody said the same thing. If we want to maintain American levels of excellence, our preeminent place in the world, there'll be an effort that comes from places like Ames and Ann Arbor and Iowa City. And I think that's even more true now, as I mentioned the towns that house major public universities. With the ever-rising cost of college that don't seem to abate whatsoever, state schools get more and more of our best students. That's only going to continue. It's very simple. To me, to someone who consistently reports on this, innovation is our future. And innovation is precipitated by one main building block. There's all sorts of variables that play into that. But the main one is education. When you have that, you can have innovation. As I said before, as in many ways how America fares tomorrow in a world of scarcer energy depends on the type of leadership we have now. I wrote part of this speech while sitting under a red oak near my house in a park. And this oak is absolutely giant. It's the biggest one I know of in my town. It's about five feet in diameter. And the town I live in, Evanston, Illinois, by American standards, is old. There's been houses on my street for about 150 years. Northwestern University, which is in Evanston, has been there for about 160 years. My point is there's been a good number of people in this spot for almost 10 generations. But for some reason, despite all of the logging that took place, and it was heavily forested, and it was basically clear-cut, to build Chicago, to build the university, to heat homes, this tree was left there. It's over 300 years old, and the reason it's there, the reason this patriarch of our local park is there is because of a string of decisions to not cut that tree down, to save it for people like me who wouldn't come for almost 200 years. It's that kind of decision-making on a grander scale that America needs right now. We may have the best country resume out there, but that ensures us of nothing. What kind of decisions am I talking about? Well, this is one that most people don't like talking about. But we have available to us a tool that can help curb our use of oil, help balance the budget, and fill government coffers with money for green energy projects, projects and the green infrastructure we'll need in the future. I'm, of course, talking about a gasoline tax. The federal gas tax is 18.4 cents. It's been 18 cents since 1992, when gas was a dollar. So back then, the federal tax made up almost 20% of the cost of gasoline. Well, now where I live, gas is about 310, and the tax is still 18 cents. So it hasn't even been adjusted to inflation, let alone the rising price of gasoline. So what happened in 2008 and in 2007 and in 2009 is the price of gas stayed up above 250 for most of the year. 
and the tax stayed at 18 cents. Well, that tax goes to what's called the Highway Trust Fund, run by the federal government, that funds the building of all these interstates and the upkeeping of them. And that fund has been largely solvent for the last 50 years. But that stopped happening in 2008 when the price of gas went to four bucks. Why? Because Americans bought less gas in 2008. Americans drove 100 billion less miles in 2008 than they did in 2007. I have to tell you how significant that is. We always drive more miles. If you look at a chart of Americans and the miles driven year after year, it's just stepped up, 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 and then all of a sudden you hit 2008. So we're not lemmings. But that highway trust fund depends on people driving. So when they didn't drive, they bought 100 billion miles less worth of gasoline. The trust fund went bankrupt. So it needed an emergency infusion from Congress. Yet they still won't rise, raise the federal gas tax. Let's just say an additional gas tax of a dollar phased in over the course of three, four years. A dollar of additional gas tax would raise $400 million a day. That's $140 billion a year. That's real money. That's difference-making money. That's money that a government starved of real revenue streams could use. On top of that, and almost just as importantly, perhaps not more, we start bringing low-level incentives for people to innovate, for people to change the way they live. It's this simple. We're going to pay 5 or $6 per gallon for gasoline at some point in the next decade. We can do it sooner and keep that money here at home to build out the type of infrastructure, the type of know-how we're going to need, or we can send that money, or we can do it later, and send that money to Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and places where we'll never see it again. And those of you say, well, Chris, we can't afford a gas tax. It's got a blunt economic growth. Well, what you're saying is that you would trade long-term security, prosperity, and innovation for short-term macroeconomics. Does that sound familiar at all? Do the words leverage derivatives and mortgage-backed securities ring a bell? Do collateralized debt obligations mean anything? It's the same thing. We watched our financial system sacrifice long-term health and security for a short-term benefit for a very select few. Not acting now while hiding behind the sacred cause of economic growth would be just as bad a crime. Decisions made during the next 20 years will affect us for the next 100 years. I fully realize that making the wise decision, the right decision, may be making an unpopular decision. And that's a lot to ask of a politician. But in short, our leaders are going to have to make decisions that may be unpopular in the short term, be it a gasoline tax or a zoning law change or whatever it is, for the benefit of the long term. Standing up and making an unpopular decision Imagine a politician doing that. But let me ask you, isn't that what leadership is? Isn't that leadership? That's all I have. Thank you. We find any uh, Korean speakers? <laughs> Question nope. time. Uh, those of you who are, uh, like yourself, not in the course. Uh, oh, there you go. Your gray hair kind of. We're, please feel welcome, whether you're in the course or not, to uh, participate in this uh, QA. Yeah, I'm an off-campus student, so I'm not normally here. But uh, thanks for uh, coming to speak to us. Glad I brought you out of the woods. I really enjoyed the book. My question is, uh, you and uh, Fr uh, Thomas Friedman, one of our other uh, readings for this course, seem to advocate uh, raising the gas tax, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, one alternative that doesn't seem to be going around is possibly privatizing the interstate system or something um, and using that capital to uh, make you mean making changes. Just, just charging people for the usage of the road. Yeah, like the sure. Chicago Skyway, which you used yeah, an example yeah. in your book. Yeah. And from experience, I drive around Chicago quite a bit. I'd take the Skyway any day, day over the Eden's Expressway, right. for example. Um, you know, and so maybe instead of a free trip from Chicago to Ames, it would be, you know, $50 in gas and 50 sure. or $100 in, in tolls. Right. Um, 
Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, that, that, that that's, in effect, the same thing. Uh, the problem, I mean, in, 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 it's not a bad solution. But to me, it's an inferior solution because it costs a lot more money to implement. You're going to have to install tolling all across the country. What's that going to cost? How much does it cost to raise the gas tax? You know, a, a dollar? I mean, all, all you have to do is have people report their extra income and raise their gas prices. Whereas you're talking about major changes to infrastructure. You're talking about a pay, uh, a pay to drive. And again, the other thing that that doesn't do is it doesn't encourage people to use less gasoline. It just encourages them to drive less miles, which is kind of the same thing, but it's kind of not. Yeah, and again, it's just far more complicated to implement. But it's better than nothing. So I would back that before I back nothing. But I think raising the gas tax is just a far easy solution. Thank you. Do you, uh, do you specifically compensate people, though, who, you know, the people that get hurt worst are the people that have to drive for their jobs and that yep. sort of thing. Do you, do you somehow compensate them so that they don't bear the massive burden that others, <clears throat> pardon me, others don't? You know, how, how do you right. see right. that? It's a, very, it's a very hard question because who's going to get hurt most by six-star gasoline? The people in the bottom quartile of society as far as incomes go. I mean, you know, especially people who live in places like Alaska or North Dakota, well, not necessarily. A lot of people in North Dakota don't drive very far to go to work. But uh, your point's well taken. It's been brought up several times, and it's very hard to avoid pain in these scenarios. It's going to happen. I do think by raising the gas tax in increments, you're able to bring on technology. You're able to incentivize private enterprise to make more fuel-efficient cars and give people cheaper solutions sooner than we would otherwise see. But pain, as far as the lower class goes, it's unavoidable. And it's, it, it's, it's horrible, but it's just a fact of life. And people, I was on Face the Nation, and this guy from Alaska called up, and his name was John. He was John from Alaska, and he was furious. He was furious with me. And he said, I drive 50 miles every day, and what am I going to do when the price of gas goes up? He was really raging mad. And he's like, I can't afford the gas now. What am I going to do then? What am I going to do? And I, I didn't have an answer for John. I just said, John, you're going to have to move. <laughs> and I, I really think that's the answer. How do you see uh, how do you see higher petroleum prices affect agriculture here in the U.S.? Um, of course, much less than one percent of the population produces all the food we have, right. the food sources we have, because of bigger equipment, which are obviously very thirsty. Yeah. How do you foresee uh, higher petroleum prices impact that? Well, certainly it affects it. I th we we saw that uh, connection. In 2007 and 2008, as commodity prices, uh, because of ethanol and some of the tie-ins there, rose in tandem with the price of oil. Uh, and, and something you didn't mention is fertilizer. Of course, I mean, when, when we eat corn, we're eating natural gas for the most part, because uh, that ammonia is made <clears throat> with the hydrogen molecule pulled off of natural gas. And a lot of that hydrogen comes from natural gas outside the country, more than 75% of it. Uh, so that is another giant problem we would face, and so the price of food will go up. But in fact, if you look at statistics going back to the 50s, food is a much, makes up a much smaller part of our incomes now for all of America, whatever class you might be in, than it did in 1950, 1960, 1970, 1980. So I do think there's a little breathing room there, but it does decrease what you'd be able to spend on other things. Uh, that said, maybe this Marcella shale gas, natural gas that's been found in the Northeast will be our salvation as far as fertilizer goes. But, you know, we're a long way from proving that source out if you guys know anything about that. But um, it's, supposed, it's, it's what's holding natural gas prices down right now. They think they've found the mother load in the Northeast. Is this on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, as far as uh, it, it's... 
almost semantics whether to call it a gas tax or a, uh, a, a, a defunding the the uh, existing s systems of, uh, of of supporting petroleum. Now, if you, right. if you Google gas real cost, I think is what I've Googled before, you have a myriad of of uh, reading material on and adv advocating for a, a cost of real cost of gas of five to fifteen dollars, depending on mm -hmm. what subsidies you're um, right. calling valid. But I mean, we definitely have subsidized gas for many, many, many years. Subsidized driving in general. Yeah. 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 So it's it's really not a gas tax. It's a, a desubsidization, really. Right. I mean, when you when people gripe about how bad our train system is. Uh, well, it's bad because it's, it's fighting a, a war it can't win. You know, if you look at a highway, look, look at all the lobbies behind making a highway. It's, it's incredible. Uh, and not to mention that the government builds those for free. So Ford and GM and Chrysler, even though they, they all, other than Ford, managed to go bankrupt, were having their products subsidized while these train companies, be it Union Pacific or BNSF or whoever it is, they're putting the whole of their infrastructure bill for the most part. And they don't want to deal with passenger rail because that's not their responsibility. Uh, but then we leave it to them to keep those rails up, and it's, it's not a fair fight between road and rail. In the United States, the federal funding breakdown for roads versus rails, something like 99 to 1 or worse, in places like Spain and France, it's about 50-50. Uh, but then getting back to what you said, the real cost of gasoline, I think Europe uh, is, people talk about how impossible and how painful this will be and how it will just destroy Americans' way of, lie, uh, way of life. But the truth is that Europeans have been doing this a long time. They live largely the same lives we already live with some changes. And they use half as much energy as we do. Uh, and they live at a, a latitude that's largely farther north than we do. How would you answer people who say that we're not really in that peak? We're not really in that peak oil. Um, that's really just a theory that has been thrown out, and that our natural um, earth will continue to produce enough oil to make the whole situation sustainable? Right. Well, I mean, that would be one way to look at it, but uh, the, the facts and the figures we have now utterly contradict that. So. Uh, if you look at the rate of discovery versus the rate of oil use, there used to be a giant excess in discovery versus use. And uh, as the 70s wore on, it pulled even, and now it's like this. And so we're just not finding enough oil to keep up. And if you, well, then you say, well, we have to drill offshore, we have to do this. I mean, the largest offshore, the largest well on United States territory, onshore or offshore, that our geological survey knows of that we haven't tapped into is the often talked about Anwar, okay? And that has anywhere between 5 billion barrels and 15 billion barrels in it. And again, in the United States, we use 7 billion barrels of oil a year. So you can do the math. Uh, it's going to benefit whoever is able to produce the oil, although as a country, it's not exactly securing our national security, as some people would tell you. But that's... You know, certainly there could be a giant mysterious oil field out there or a silver bullet of some sort, but right now we don't have it. Hi, I just want to thank you for um, coming to talk to us today, and thank you for the book. It was a great read. Um, I just wanted to sort of ask you, um, in this transition from, uh, I guess, our oil dependence, um, I, I mean, I'm sure as most of us agree, this is going to happen. And um, what your book talks about is mostly the events that are going to happen. So I just wanted to focus on like the actual transition. Like, oh, this is just going to be like utter chaos. Just people are like, just people frantic as in this uh, right. dynamic situation right now. Or what do you forecast? No, I, I really think it's it's going to be smoother. I, I mean, I wouldn't call it smooth, but I think the market's going to react to the price of oil. You're going to see things go up, go down. Go up, go down, and you know there will be new basements on the price that'll be higher and higher as the years wear on. But as I said, there is demand destruction 
at higher oil prices. So if the price of gas goes up to six bucks, we're going to use less. So that'll mitigate some of the effects of excess, uh, of, of too much demand, because people aren't going to want to pay. They're going to change their behavior. But that's what this is all about in the end. Uh, people will change their behavior. They'll change how they live. And they're like, well, and a lot of people say, well, Chris, you say people are going to move to the cities. Well, there's not enough room in the cities. And no, there's not. But just like there was a demand for exurbia in the 1990s and the early 2000s, and we built it because people could make money building it, if, we can make, if people can make money building denser projects, places people can walk, where people can walk to school, et cetera, et cetera, they're going to build that. It's capitalism. What do you see happening with the countries that are oil producing, <clears throat> the large oil producing countries now? What happens once their reserves right. fall and they're out of the oil business? Well, that's, I mean, that is a wild card. And if you subscribe to the uh, long emergency theory, they're just going to shut down the borders and not let any oil out. Um, but if you look at most of the countries, that you're speaking of, their whole economy depends on exporting oil. And the Saudis realize that. They have green projects going there. And they're not, they tell you they want to become a leader in green energy, but what they're really trying to do is preserve their one and only export. And I, how else can those countries function in a global economy unless they're able to export energy? So unless they change, I think you, you might have panics and you might have strange regimes like that in Iran that just shuts down the borders. And when you look at the energy consumption growth rates per capita in places like Saudi Arabia and Iran, it doesn't look good. You're right. I mean, they use more and more of their own oil every day. But at some point, I would think there has to be an equilibrium reached, just like there has to be one reached here. Uh, yeah, I, I certainly agree that you know, we're looking at the uh, economic cost of scarce energy in the future, it seems like another major consideration that is going to have a large economic cost and is somewhat related is the idea of irreversible global change. And have you given any thought to how these are going to interplay together? Irreversible global change meaning globalization? Uh, weather change. Uh, oh, weather, are you talk, oh, we're talking about uh, climate change. Which is going to be very expensive. Okay, there's a lot of terms for climate change, so that was another one. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I read somewhere yesterday we're on track for the hottest year of all time. I mean, so I guess that, there goes the, uh, all those junk theories from the last three years. Uh, I'm a subscriber to global warming. I, I think it's real. I think it's happening. I, um, I didn't, I, if I mentioned it twice in the book, that, I think that was it. Uh, it's just not something I wanted to dive into. It's not what the book was about. But yeah, that is another lever in raising the oil price, because at some point, there has to be a price on carbon. So if there's a price on carbon, there's a price on oil, there's a price on everything we do when it comes down to energy. And that's going to, again, squeeze out the inefficiencies, which means, again, more of the changes that I talk about. Will it unfold exactly as I wrote? No, I'm sure it won't. But I feel like some of those changes are not negotiable. Uh, I feel like you just might have answered my question, but I was just going to say uh, if we create the infrastructure and we change the way people live, move them to the cities, and, and we reduce our consumption of, of oil, uh, how do we keep the, the price of oil uh, from being so low that people don't want to change back to their old habits and move back out of the cities right. and right. Well, the way they're living today? But I think maybe with the, the, carbon, the carbon tax is what is what might be something that... Yeah, yeah, well, there's that, and, and, but to your point, the, the major lever of change here is the price of oil. So uh, you're not going to get to a point where we've changed everything and the price of oil just crashes because oil is just too damn useful, and all the easy-to-get stuff, we're going to burn it. It's just the facts. Uh, I, you know, I, as... As someone of environmentalist, I wish that weren't the case. I mean, I'm a full-blown environmentalist. So let's just get that out there. But, uh, um, 
but we're going to, all the easy to get oil, we're going to burn it. It's going to happen. So uh, it's to say that there's going to be a lot of oil laying around and we're not going to use it, I just, unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. We're going to use it. People are still going to be driving on oil 20 years from now. There's no doubt about it. The question is, what is the mix? And it's finding that right mix. Because, there's, again, there's some things that oil can do that other stuff just can't do. There's nothing else I can get an airplane up in the air. And there's nothing else that is going to power right now uh, things that are way offshore, big machinery, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, it's just a great, great resource. What about fuels like biodiesel? Well, biodiesel is great. Obviously, the problem is you need the hydrogen and the carbon. You need the feedstock. And if you're Brazil and you can make sugarcane work, that's great. But right, you know, in the United States, ethanol, as it exists right now, is largely a subsidized product. It's great stuff, but it's not the answer. It's just, it's just another farm subsidy is what it is. Well, I mean, feels like uh, I've got a friend who makes diesel out of peanut oil in his sure. garage. Right. I mean, I I can assure I can assume that uh, the production levels might not be nearly right. as much as we have for oil, but I'm wondering what kind of place they might have. Right. Well, I mean, we I think we probably I know several people who go around restaurant to restaurant in Evanston and gather up used vegetable oil and put it in their diesel engines. They've got an old VW or something like that. And that's great, but of course, if we all start doing that, there's no vegetable oil left. So, there's not, you know, there's not that much of that to go around. Uh, when it's merely a novel activity of, of some outlying people, it's cool, but it's just, it's not a wholesale answer. Do you have any feel for uh, price point inflections that might exist in the oil market? For instance, the extraction price when FT takes over as a coal replacement? Do you have any feel for where those price points might be? You know, sort of fifty bucks, eighty bucks, a hundred bucks. Well, I suppose I suppose you could you know backtrack um, from the book, but I once you get past once you go past two hundred, I think it's largely a crapshoot because uh, at that point you don't know what governments are going to do. You know they're going to do something, but you don't know what. And they're going to be some of the biggest players, drivers of change in the future. And, of course, the government hasn't done a darn thing yet, but that's because we just haven't hit that tipping point at this point. So my short answer is I have the tipping points I set out in the book on a consumer level, but I will tell you that it gets very hard to differentiate one from another once you go past $10 per gallon when we're talking about the price of gas. Um, so in some ways, other than food, I mean, uh, the, our food paradigm, and of course, this being Iowa, uh, if you've read The Omnivores of Limit, you know almost as much about it as I do, uh, but we have all sorts of bizarre food paradigms uh, in the world, from fresh Norwegian fish that are sold in Norwegian fish markets that actually go to China and back before Norwegians eat them, uh, to grocery stores, in Spain on the Citrus Coast selling lemons from Argentina. Uh, it's just something, when I go into a grocery store in Chicago, I usually, and I buy apples, which I buy a lot of, I usually am buying an apple from Washington State or New Zealand, or even sometimes Japan. I'm rarely seeing apples from Michigan or Southeast Wisconsin, which of course are very close to Chicago, but because Safeway has figured out a way to get an apple from New Zealand because of a connection with some conglomerate to me cheaper than dealing with farmers in Michigan, that's what I see. In the future, that's not going to be the case. So there's, uh, that's a long answer. But I guess my, I guess my short answer is it's, it's really hard to say past the $200 per barrel mark. Uh, speaking of diesel, um, I got a friend who bought a brand new diesel truck and he bought his one that was three years older got four miles better gallon. So, like with all this emission stuff, to get less fuel, to get more fuel consumption, is that like smart? To buy diesel? Yeah. No, I mean like with the EPA having all these emission standards, but like his same truck, same displacement. He has a Duramax diesel. Got four, oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying the older diesel did better than the newer diesel. Yeah, but with is that smart with like 
I think it's smart. Consumption. I mean, the new diesels are pretty efficient. I, maybe the old ones are slightly more efficient. I, I actually don't really know. But I know that, you know, you can go out right, right now and buy a brand new Volkswagen Jetta TDI that gets like 50 miles per gallon. That's pretty good. And there's no battery involved. And that is at the new diesel standard. So maybe it, maybe it took a little oomph off the old diesel. But it seems to me that, uh, in, but the old diesel was so dirty. The particulate matter, which is the biggest problem with gasoline pollution, all, most of it came from diesel engines, and it had to be cleaned up. And that was probably one of the best things that the Bush administration did on a very short list of things. But so. <clears throat> uh, in your opinion, uh, what do you think is going to help? happen to the housing market as more and more people move to um, denser environments? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, your entering suburbs in first-tier cities are going to do, or, you know, in the entering neighborhoods, et cetera, are going to do very well. Uh, this is going out 15 years from now. But, again, there is a limit, I think, at the relationship of a ratio of, say, the price of an entering burb versus an exurb. So, you know, you can't have homes, I mean, right now in Chicago, let's say if you're talking about an entering burb, like say Oak Park, where I live, Evanston, those homes are maybe between two and three times as much as say Aurora and Elgin and stuff like that. But I mean, the question is how, how much higher can those push than these homes which are actually in the same metro area? At some point, I think you have developers saying, oh, people want that life. And they'll build it in other places. And there's suburbs that are figuring it out. They're not all going to go to ghost towns. Some of them are going to build density in. So I do think, you know, if I were buying today, I'd definitely want to be in a place that had, you know, a good walkability score. But I do think some neighborhoods that don't have those scores now will be better places in the future. But it's, it's a crapshoot to say which ones. But I, as I said, it's a supply and demand thing. If enough people want it and the prices go high enough in the cities, and the entering burbs, the outer ring burbs are going to change as well. Uh, it feels like you just touched on this a little bit, but uh, uh, your opinion was that um, our decreased in de dependence on oil is uh, going to uh, going to rely on us being in more uh, metropolitan areas, being closer to our work, and driving less. And I wondered what your comments would be about uh, uh, the individuality of American culture and those people who, who want the big yards in the suburbs and uh, want to drive the big cars. Right. Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen to those people that refuse to change? Uh, you know, I mean, if you can afford not to change, you won't change. And you don't want to change. And there's always going to be somebody who can afford... I hate to invoke another Chicago suburb name, uh, but you know there's always going to be people afford to can afford to live in Barrington, which is a far northwest burb that's full of McMansion, you know, giant places with big lakes and all this kind of stuff. That is, you know, the upper one percent of society. But I, you know, the upper five percent, they're not going to be as affected by this. So they have an extra three hundred dollars a month in gas bills. It's not that big a deal. So some people will not be affected. There's always going to be big houses and big lawns. Now, if you're in the middle, you're probably going to have to change to some degree. But to say that that's going to lead to some type of homogenization of America is a little crazy. I mean, think about New York City. Would you call New York City homogenous? So I don't think so. So would that contribute to the widening of the gap between the haves and the have-nots? You know, just as always, the haves are going to have more options. I don't, I don't know that, uh, I mean, just, it's, just a, it's just a difference in terms, right? I mean, the, ha the super haves can fly in private jets. The, haves not, the have nots are, and you know, obviously there's different levels of have nots. Those have nots are flying southwest. In the future, maybe the haves are flying southwest and the have nots are driving to a beach in Michigan. Thank you. You've uh, talked about urbanization, but uh, in my view, the cheapest place to live is uh, here in rural Iowa. What's your opinion of uh, 
the development of rural areas and smaller communities in this scenario? Well, somewhere in this Korean book, there's, there's a chapter on small towns. And um, I, I don't think the small town is, is dead at all. I think there's people who want that lifestyle. And uh, it's going to be alive and well in the future. And depending on how you view a small town, I think a lot of small towns are going to be enhanced, in fact, by the future. Because more people are going to live closer to Main Street. There's going to be more local goods for sale. Certainly, you're not going to make iPods in town. The high-value added goods are going to come from where they have to come from. But there's going to be more local food. There's going to be more repairs made locally. Uh, and Walmart, for instance, has a foot in both camps. Uh, they're always pushing for more globalization because it's how they get the prices lower. But they're watching the future. There's a lot of very smart people in Arkansas, and they realize that the future may not go exactly how they want it to. So they're exploring the idea of having, instead of 200,000 square foot stores 10 miles outside of town, having 12,000 square foot stores on Main Street that now, I, for some reason, I can't remember what the project's called. It's called, like, Local Market or something like that, Market Square. But anyway, they, they have yet to install one, but there is a pilot program at, in Benton where they're thinking about putting out pilot stores where they would put in a small town a 12,000 square foot Walmart that offered groceries and a mix of other sundries in town. So I don't think small towns are going to go away at all. I think there's people who want that lifestyle, and the Internet is going to further enable that. So if you're a contractor or whatever it is that you do, you're going to be able to work just as you are now, but to an even better degree in a small town. And I think the small towns that do the best are going to be the ones on existing rail lines, the ones on rivers, and the ones not too far, meaning within 300 miles of a large town, because part of that is, is being a tourist destination, so, which, which helps these places stay vibrant. Okay, hello. Uh, as you were writing your book, what proof did you find that suggested Americans would Say, I'm sorry, I didn't oh, hear you. Sorry. What, as you were writing your book, what proof did you find that Americans would seek train travel as a main system of transportation when the gas prices reached, let's say, $18 versus $10? Right, okay. Well, I, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, once it gets past 10, it's hard to disseminate where to put one from another. So I will say that massive change could happen at $10 per gallon on the train front. Uh, there are some things in the structure of that book that, you know, I just had to put places in, in certain places. Um, mind you, when I first started writing the book, I hadn't intended to go all the way to $20 per gallon, but they liked that as a title, so that's where I went. Um, I had planned on ending a little earlier. But yeah, you make a very good point. And again, government's a big wild card. If they start pushing the high-speed train ticket a lot earlier, you know, it could happen at $6. Because what's really going to push high-speed train travel is when the normal middle-class person can't afford to fly almost anywhere. And I go to these high-speed train meetings in Chicago, and I will tell you, like, Two years ago, it was like a smattering of people. Last year, the place was packed. And part of that had to do with some of the funding Obama gave to Amtrak. But part of it had to do with the price of oil. And when gas is 6 bucks a gallon, they're going to need... It's not going to be just train geeks that are at these things. It's going to be normal people. And the plans exist for high-speed rail. But the need for money is there. When, when normal Joe Schmo is making a demand from his politicians in the voting box for high-speed rail, that's when it's going to happen. And that happens when flying becomes too expensive. Thank you. So your talk ended with a hope for more leadership from the politicians. Mm. But if one is cynical, one has to wait for something, some event, for the politicians to start to react. What do you think will be the first step which will cause politicians to build? Will it be just that the price is high and people, oil is high and people will start to complain? Or will it be, will it be, will it be other features that cause politicians finally to act? What, you say, would it be the price or something? What, what will cause them to act? Well, I'm, I'm, I would suspect that other things... Uh, it's, I'm sure, you know, know, knowing what the... If we're just going to say, talk about the gas tax, that right now is the ultimate third rail in Washington. 
So, I mean, you have the Obama administration, which was willing to tackle health care, which, you know, if there was one thing you had to pick, there's not much harder than that. But they still want nothing to do with raising the gas tax, even though any fool could see that, you know, this thing should at least be pegged to the price of gas or inflation or something. Uh, but they still want nothing to do with that. It's political cyanide. So I do think, unfortunately, it's probably going to take some measure of a crisis to get people moving. And that's typically how politics work. What kind of crisis do you think will come first? What kind of prices, you said? Crisis. 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 Well, crisis meaning, say, gas prices six dollars a gallon, which would be a crisis on some level, especially if we got there rather quickly. Now, of course, that would affect the economy, and there would be demand destruction again. I'm sure the price would eventually go down unless there was another reason for it going up rather than pure global demand. But that would be a crisis. And so in my mind, the kind of effects that have in the economy, the kind of effects that have in people, people's lives, voters' lives, that's going to light the fire. Maybe it's time to, um, to bring this part of things to a close. Chris has told me that um, he'll be happy to meet with students and others uh, after. Um, if you got your book, I'm sure he'd be happy to sign it. If you'd like him to do that, I'm going to have him sign mine. And so at this stage, uh, let's just say thank you for a nice talk. And thank you. We'll approach him downstairs. <laughs>